We're delighted to be with you this morning. As, uh, as you've just heard, this is our, our, our first time with you from Own Company, where we position as the number one SaaS data protection platform. Let me tell you a little bit more about what we do. As, as you've just heard, I'm the Market Intelligence Director. What does that mean? I'm responsible for analyst relations. Uh, I look after all of our competitive intelligence, but I also commission our customer and market research. The benefit of that, or the great joy I have, is I get the, the, have the good fortune of speaking with our customers, potential customers and partners, on a daily basis, and, and, and hopefully that qualifies me uh, to share some thoughts and insights with you today. Alice, why don't you introduce yourself? Yep, thanks Graham. Uh, nice to meet everyone. So, Senior Speech Engineer, what does that mean? So, I work on the pre-sales side of the business, so reaching out to prospects, understanding the current situation, and really how we can help uh, with our product suite. Uh, my role is quite technical, and I go into product demonstrations, proof of concepts, and also I get to go to events like this and uh, showcase our products, which I'm really looking forward to doing today. And Andrew Hart, I need a new photo. You can barely see me in this one. No, that, was, that was by design, Andrew. Yeah, I am, I'm the VP of services. We're not going to talk too much about our services here. So I, I work with our biggest, or my teams work with our biggest and most complex customers, uh, providing services that complement our, our products. I, I'm here today as a technologist. Um, I'm multi-cloud certified. And before I joined OWN, I had a career in CRM consultancy. I was the lead technical architect at Accenture in their Salesforce <coughs> business group before I came here. Super. So what are we going to cover? Um, our agenda is, is, is pretty simple. We want to brief you on the customers that we serve, the problems that our solutions solve for them, and of course we're going to talk to you about the technology that we bring to market. We are going to pepper the session this morning with, uh, with live product demonstrations, uh, and, uh, and, and as you heard at the start, questions are welcome throughout. I understand that you're a group that will not be shy with questions. We've already agreed, certainly Alice and I have, that any difficult questions will be directed to Andrew. Uh, we'll take them, no, I'm all kidding. We, between us, we should, uh, I would hope that we'd be well equipped to answer any of, uh, any of your questions. So what are we going to do quickly? I think we should start with an introduction of the company as a whole and give you an overview uh, of, uh, of, of the organization. We're then going to get into the solutions. Uh, and we're going to talk to you about and show you how we help to, our customers to protect their mission critical SaaS data and to activate and get value from that data. We will talk briefly later about our security credentials, a little bit about our services offerings as well. Uh, we will end with uh, a glimpse of the future and, uh, and our, our future direction and plans. Uh, and there should be time at the end for, for Q&A as well. That's the plan. Um, so let's get started. What, uh, what do I <coughs> want you to know about Own Company? Well, here's a bunch of numbers. We uh, are, are an eight-year-old business headquartered out of New Jersey in the US, but uh, quite a significant global presence. Uh, we have annual recurring revenues in excess of 200 million US dollars and growing. We currently support over 6,700 customers of all shapes and sizes. Uh, our, our customers also are across every industry sector and vertical. I'll give you some logos in a moment. 150 of those organizations are on the US Fortune 500 list, so fairly significant in size and scale. Uh, we have lots of happy customers. Of course we would say that, but what's the evidence? Well, we have over 500 five-star reviews on the Salesforce App Exchange. Uh, if G2 is your, uh, your peer review platform of choice, then we've been a leader in the SaaS backup category uh, for 15 consecutive quarters. I think we have around 260 or 270 reviews on that particular platform as well. We ran a study with an analyst firm uh, last year. Uh, which saw them interview a number of our customers, and they concluded that we deliver, a, on average, a 525% ROI over a three-year period. That study also concluded that a typical own co company customer uh, has a three-month payback <coughs> period. So their investment is covered in three months. Uh, at present, we support three platforms. We will go into this in more detail just now, but the majority of our customers use Salesforce. A growing number of them use the Microsoft Dynamics 365 and Microsoft Power Platform, uh, and a growing number two using ServiceNow. How much revenue do you have on the continent? I can't tell. I can tell you. I can't tell you a specific revenue figure because I don't have it. But I can tell you that over 30% of our customers are outside North America. And do you have any business in Germany? Yes, we do. I mean, actually, Germany is, is a target market for us. So yes, we do have some customers there just now, uh, but it's, a, it's an emerging market for us. Okay, uh, let me go back to my, my numbers. I, I think uh, 
I thought it might be useful to, to share that we, on a daily basis, currently back up over four petabytes of data. I'm told that since our inception eight years ago, we have backed up 3.5 exabytes of, uh, of, of data for customers. Uh, I hope nobody asks me what an exabyte is, because I'm going to struggle with the answer, but I know it's a lot. That's, that's the point here. Uh, and currently, we operate out of seven locations. Uh, I mentioned already that headquarters are across in New Jersey and the east coast of the US. We have uh, a team in San Diego and California. Uh, we have a, just over 100 people based here in the UK with a London office just down from Liverpool Street. Uh, we have a team in France, uh, in, in Israel and Tel Aviv, where most of our developers are based. Uh, we also have some development team in, uh, in India and a small team across in Sydney and Australia. Uh, and, uh, and you beat me to it, but I was going to flag that we're, we are going to be putting more offices to the list starting with Germany this year. Please. Is it like a really straightforward install? and then an ongoing kind of subscription thing? Yeah, we, or is there a huge amount of work to do at the start and then it's an ongoing? That's, that's, a, great, that's, a, great, that's a great question. I'm glad you asked it. It's a really simple deployment process for us. Uh, but it is a subscription revenue model, yes. Yeah. So, uh, so we have that, that recurring revenue. Um, a typical own customer who's just deploying our Salesforce backup and recovery solution will be live in under 45 minutes with an onboarding call. Yeah, within 45 minutes, we're backing up their data and it's protected. And the factor which determines the prices, the amount of data? Or the amount of no, our, our, our pricing model is based on number of users, so it's licenses. Uh, and that, in, with regards to our competitive landscape, that, that is the model that's adopted by most of our competitors. There are a couple uh, where they base their pricing on the amount of data being protected or, or stored. Please. Concentrating on recovery rather than backup. You talk about Absolutely. the biggest backup company. Yeah. I think I, was, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, I, was, uh, I, I did an interview with a new customer yesterday uh, who made exactly that point that for them they needed to know they were using a, 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 another provider and they switched to us because that other provider was helping them to check the backup box, but when they suffered a data loss, uh, they discovered that the recovery process was really rather complicated and, and ineffective. That brought them to market. Uh, and one of the primary reasons that, that we win uh, new logos is because of our restore capabilities. Okay. Oops. How do you to test? And the other part of that is you don't have a recovery process unless it's been tested. Yes. So how easy is to test <coughs> safely because testing of recovery can in fact yeah, it's a, another great question. So as part of our, our sales process, we encourage, encourage every prospective customer to go through a proof of concept. What that means is we give them access to a sandbox. We take a copy of their existing data, so data that they know, data that they're, they're familiar with the different relationships, and we put that into that sandbox, and then we give them free access to the tools. We're in the background to help and support, so they get hands-on with the solutions. Uh, we encourage them to test all of their use cases. So, so uh, they get to see firsthand the usability of the solutions, but they get to make sure and verify that, uh, that the solutions are going to deliver the outcomes that they want. That includes uh, you know, deleting data, corrupting data of different types and different volumes, and then demonstrating to or letting the customer see for themselves uh, the ability of our tools to help them diagnose the data loss, understand what's been affected, and then to precisely restore just the affected data. So, so that's a, a really important part of the process for us. Usability seems to be key to me. Yeah. When you come to use this stuff, you're probably in panic mode. Yes. And that's when you make mistakes. Yeah. Yes. We, 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 so firstly, our backup product is called Recover, because that is the important thing. If you can't recover from it, it's just an export. It's not a backup. Um, and the recovery is key. You're actually going to see it in the, in the demo today. But yes, we say that exact same thing. And you don't want your, your platform owner to be running a recovery exercise 3 a.m. on a Monday morning, right, six hours before the business is coming in, stress. and you, know, you want training and muscle memory to actually use the tool, which is intuitive, but still to know the process and work through it. Uh, are you going to expand the number of platforms you are supporting? Yes. For example, if I think of Germany, SAP is absolutely indispensable. Yes. So if you want to do business there and you don't do SAP, you will probably have bad Right. Yeah, absolutely. There's a danger I'm going to repeat most of this later on, or, 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 or we'll veer from the slides. But absolutely, we are, in, we are a multi-cloud, uh, multi-platform cloud organization, and our future aspiration is to add 
uh, platforms and, and clouds to that. I mentioned those customers. Now, it's, it's, I, I imagine it's obligatory in these kind of sessions to have this NASCAR logo slides, but uh, what I want to, to, to give you a strong sense of is when I said earlier we have customers across every industry, in, in every industry sector and vertical, we really do. Uh, if, if you're a user of Salesforce, you are a potential own company customer. Likewise ServiceNow, likewise Microsoft Dynamics 365 and the Power Platform. And to your question from before, 30% uh, of, uh, of our logos are outside North America, predominantly within Northern Europe. So UK, Ireland, France, the Nordics, uh, Benelux and so on. The, the, the Salesforce backup area with SAP is very fragmented. Mm. Do you still see consolidation happening? It's, well, I'm responsible for competitive intelligence. What I've seen is more companies moving into the market in the past couple of years. When I joined Own Company three years ago, I counted that we had 14 potential competitors in talking to organisations around Salesforce data protection. That number is now a little north of 20 uh, and continues to grow. I do believe there will be consolidation. The market is already consolidating in terms of some, vend some vendors are very much focused on small business. Others are seeking to position as actually we support and are only interested in supporting global enterprises. Um, we're seeing <coughs> you know, traditional or legacy backup providers like Commvault adding SaaS into their portfolio and moving into the market as well. So I believe, yes, there will be further consolidation within the market, but I still think we're in a period where, where there'll be more entrants coming in as well. I think though, that the important uh, point to take from that is, well, well why? It's because the market's big. Now we are, we believe, the single largest uh, vendor in the Salesforce backup and recovery space. And I've told you how many customers we have. Salesforce has over 200,000 organizations using it. So the total addressable market is significant and it is growing. And that's just in the Salesforce world. Apply that then across service now, apply that across Microsoft Dynamics, Power Platform, and those other ecosystems and applications that we'll move into. Uh, and I hope it gives you a sense that, that there's plenty for us to, uh, to go at. So, 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 you first. so for you, the 200,000 Salesforce customers are your potential customers? Absolutely right. I think it's you first, then you. Lots of hands. Sorry, uh, isn't there a problem with um, scaling if you don't handle the very smallest people? Mm. There's a discontinuity that people, when they start <coughs> small, use a different solution, but they have to swap over to a higher scale solution mm. partway through the business. And that's, that's a risk because they'll have to swap over too late mm. or too mm. early. And I'd really like to see a... I see you've got proof of concept. I suppose you have got the very small size. We do. But um, <coughs> you need to be able to go from the very smallest to the very largest with the same company if you want to do that. Absolutely, and, and I would argue that, that that's exactly what we do. So we have plenty of organisations at, at the, the lower end of the spectrum that are using our services. We have customer retention rates uh, in, in the high 90%, uh, and therefore we, we don't at present have any issues in terms of retaining those organisations as they grow. Indeed, what typically happens is as organisations grow, we see them becoming even more, more dependent upon their main technology stacks, such as Salesforce or ServiceNow and so forth. Uh, and so, so they become even more stickier to the platforms and therefore supporting them is, is more critical. And, and I, I do believe that, that we can evidence that we support those organisations. a competitive advantage against firms that target small customers yes. and can't really scale up. Yeah, and, and, and whilst most of our new customers just now we will be their first backup and recovery solution for Salesforce service and our dynamics and so forth. And that is the majority of our sales opportunities is at present, they're doing nothing. But you know, there's an increasing number coming through where they are switching from some of those kind of very primary low level providers where again, they're effectively ticking the backup box. But in terms of restoration capabilities, they're a bit lacking. And, uh, and oftentimes, it, it's, the reality is they've suffered a loss of corruption of some kind. And that's the catalyst to them come to market and say, OK, well, we've had this solution, but it's clearly not meeting our needs any longer. Well, actually, I can talk to that in a moment. But Andrew, let me... Yeah, I'm just going to add a couple of points there. So one, two things we do to help our small market customers. One is we work through partners. So if they're below the minimum size, a partner can provide it almost as a managed service. Mm -hmm. um, so we use the partner channel for that. The second is for uh, users along, let's call it a somewhat happy path right there. They're not using their own encryption keys. They just want to use 
the backup service out of the box, you could say, we have a, a very low touch, almost a self-serve option for them as well, literally credit card purchase, get live, get on. So we do, the cost of acquisition for those small customers is, is obviously disproportionate, so we try and self-serve or partner channel those as much as we can. Please. Um, first, how much of your revenue is done by Salesforce, because you're talking about yeah. Salesforce, yeah. but not so much about the other stuff. Mm. Yes. And second, what would, you, for example, I know that Microsoft also has some rudimentary backup service. And I mean, of course, they have the power, if they wanted to, yes. they could make a backup service which is and, and, and functioning and so on. Yes. What if the, the companies come to the point and say, okay, we'll do the backup ourselves? Yes. It's I, mostly what you ask, but for the others, or more generalized. Mm. Two really good questions as well. Let me, let me address the first one. So the vast majority of our current revenues is from Salesforce using organizations. Uh, so it, it is, but, but you know, hence the, the strategy to be multi-cloud. Um, so it was only in 2022 that we introduced our Microsoft Dynamics 365 solution, uh, and less than a year since we've been in the ServiceNow market. So, so those those markets are, are of increasing importance to us, but I, I will not shy away from or, or mm. tend to deny that the majority of our customers just now are in the Salesforce world. Um, the, the answer to your second question, I think, sits with the shared responsibility model. I, 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 I hope there's no, there, I'm not at risk of patronising you in any way, but the majority of SaaS vendors, including Salesforce and Dyna Microsoft with Dynamics and ServiceNow, We'll, we'll adopt a shared responsibility model where they will say, we're, we will take responsibility for the, the network, the infrastructure, for making sure that there's 99.99, etc. Uh, percent uptime and so forth. But you, dear customer, are responsible for the protection and management of the information you put into or onto our platform. And there are very strong and compelling reasons for SaaS vendors to continue to want to operate that shared responsibility model. You're absolutely right to note that Microsoft Dynamics actually comes with some rudimentary backup capabilities, as does ServiceNow. But as we're seeing, those capabilities are primary, are very low level, very short of functionality, and so there's really still compelling reasons why, why organizations would, uh, would want to use a third-party vendor for that protection. Please. Sorry, <coughs> using the expression earlier, muscle memory, which I think is great. <sighs> if you had if you had a typical install, I don't know, a thousand seats or whatever, <coughs> you discover a problem Monday afternoon, something grim, just ballpark, just an overview, you, you notice there's a problem, you've got the own solution in whatever level it works. Mm -hmm. What, what, what does it look like to the person who goes, ah, it's gone wrong? And does it have, does it make any difference? Is it much more significant if it's some kind of ransomware attack? Yeah. And you've got the possibility that previous backups have been infected. These are all good questions. I'm going to start and then I'm going to call on uh, Andrew and Alice to, 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 to <laughs> chip in on this one. Oh, and then, I'll, <laughs> then I promise I'll come to you. So the first thing I would say is, is that part of one of the, the, the capabilities that we offer is, is we call it smart alerts. And so it means that any customer is able to set thresholds. We're effectively saying to our solution, hey, if you spot changes in my data day to day that are above this threshold, then I'd like you to alert me. Um, and actually, so, so for many of our customers suffering a data loss or, or corruption, the first thing time they learn about it is actually from our daily message that says, well, you know what, there was, there was over 50 accounts deleted yesterday. Was that by, was that by design or, or is, there, is, is there an issue there? And it's a feature that, uh, that a lot of our customers take great comfort from because some will just choose to set and forget. Um, and so that, that little alerting uh, mechanism is, is really valuable. Okay, so whether it's alerted by that or, or, or somebody from the business has said, hold on, I can't find my contact records uh, or, or such like. Um, then the process for us is it's an independent login to, uh, to our platform. So you don't have to go through Salesforce service or Microsoft, so you can access that. Uh, and then we, we, we offer um, uh, investigative tools that allow you to, to diagnose what's gone wrong and what's changed. Andrew, Alice, could you maybe talk a little bit more to that? Well, I was going to say you're going to see a lot of it in the demo that Alice is, is giving in, in a bit, smart alerts and how to actually compare what happened uh, against the snapshots. Um, but I mean, it, it depends is the answer, right? But there's a huge difference between 50 accounts in Graham's example there to 100,000 accounts disappearing. And accounts are a grandfather object, right? They've got contacts and they've got contracts and cases and opportunities and a whole bunch of hierarchy between them. So it, it's going to depend, um, but you will see some of that data model represented in the, in the demo as well. I think you had your hand up. Uh, 
Um, since 2021, in fact, in 2021, you guys raised around $400 million. Yes. Right? Um, and that's where the hockey stick for your revenues also went up. Yes. Which means you're burning through a boatload of money. What happened in 2021 that you know, uh, enabled you to, you know, uh, that sp spawned the uh, investment? To, to, to earn the funding? Uh, yeah. Um, I would go, I, my answer would be to refer back to that total addressable market from earlier on. Um, Salesforce has been around for a long time. This is not new. It, it, it has, but actually what's become increasingly evident to organisations is, one, the data loss and corruption is real. It happens. And two, the consequences of it are really significant, whether it's affecting your ability to service your customers, whether it's hitting bottom line profitability, whether it's the cost of resolving and so forth. And, and we and others have been evangelising about this for, for a number of years. And, and, it, and, and so the honest answer is it, the messaging started to stick and there was a recognition that, uh, that this needed to happen. How much did it, COVID it, um, contribute to this? Sorry? How much did COVID contribute to this? No, it wasn't a driver. It wasn't, it wasn't a driver at all. Um, you know, the, the, the revenue patterns were, were already there for us. Um, so, so no, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't pretend that that's been a particular catalyst. It's been to $200 million in, the, in, in a couple of years. It's, uh, <coughs> it is. You know, it, it's, it, uh, it, is unu it is unusual. I mean, I, I would, uh, yeah, in, in some respects, I'd like to say, well, that's, that's thanks to our executive leadership team and the work that they've been doing. But uh, yeah, we're very happy with the, the funding that we've been able to, to source. You will notice that we haven't had any funding increases since then because there isn't a requirement to. Uh, you're right, we have been spending money. That money has been invested in two primary areas. Sales and marketing. We've hired bodies. Uh, and, I mean, uh, Lane is renowned for hiring a boatload of money and paying them people very, very well. Yeah. And, and Kevin Delane, by the way, for the benefit of everybody else around the table, is our, yeah. okay. is our, is our fairly newest chief revenue officer. And that's exactly what we've been doing. So, <coughs> you know, we, we, you know, Kevin has come in. But I think the other thing I would say about Kevin is he has a track record of success sure. and, yeah, and turning that investment into profitability. So, yeah. Yeah. There, was, yeah. there was one other thing that happened in 2021 was own secure. So we started the journey of not just being a backup company, but actually being a data governance company. And okay. that messaging landed as well with the launch of, well, the acquisition of, of RevCult, which became our secure product. Okay. Yeah. Can you say anything about the Cohesity partnership? What I would say is that we do not offer a Microsoft 365 solution. Mm. You do not offer? We, we do not offer a Microsoft 365 solution or, you know, Office as was. And of course, Cohesity does. Uh, and so at present, we are you know, introducing our customers who are using perhaps Salesforce and Office 365 or Microsoft 365, and we will bring in Cohesity uh, to support those customers and vice versa. Uh, so at, at the moment, it's very much a kind of almost a, a referral partnership, uh, but there is, uh, there is joint development work underway. And how is the Veritas um, um, acquisition, I think, was um, going to impact? I mean, it's breaking news, isn't it? It's just been, just been within the past couple of weeks. So I don't think I have an answer yet other than it, uh, it certainly caught our attention. It was something I understand that we were aware of through the partnership with Cohesity. Um, we do see Veritas as, 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 as much more focused on the, the security aspect of that, that data governance and data protection spectrum. We have some crossover with their solutions. It's early days uh, for, for me to give you a straight answer in terms of how that will pan out, but please. You <coughs> talked about data governance. What happens with things like GDPR and people who want to have their data deleted from backups yeah. mm -hmm. okay. and stuff like that? How do, you, how do you manage that? Can I suggest that we address that in the demo? Because we're going to show you exactly yeah. that. Um, yeah. And indeed, we're going to touch on a number of the other points that, that you've made here when we get to show you the solution actions, such as restoration capabilities, such as to your points are around you know, what happens when there is a data loss, what's the process look like for the customer. So I think rather than just telling you, uh, you, you, you can see that in action, if, uh, if that's okay. That and the fact that we've got another 347 slides to go. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I might have exaggerated just a little there, you'll, you'll be pleased to know. Um, I mentioned quickly, uh, final, final logo slide, I mentioned Fortune 500, uh, what I again hope you will get a sense of from here, it's across financial services, it's across healthcare, it's across pharma, uh, it's across retail, it's across construction and business services and, uh, and so forth. Um, 
So uh, there was a question earlier on about our, our spread of customers. Uh, yes, we have many at, uh, that might be characterised as small to medium sized enterprises, uh, but a significant number who are, are, are enterprise and, and global enterprise as well. I hope I've given you a good overview of the company and the organisation. So that's one of our agenda <laughs> items covered. And thank you for all the questions. I, I hope we've done a good job of answering those. But, but I think it's time that we, we talk to you about, well, how do we support those customers and, uh, and what we do for them? The starting point for us is this, my final slide for the moment, and I get the hand across to Andrew, which is, you know, our positioning to, to organisations is, hey, the fact that you're using Salesforce, doesn't actually differentiate you from your competitors also using Salesforce. It's a wonderful tool and application and can deliver wonderful outcomes. But really what matters is how you're using the SaaS applications, the data that you're putting in there and what you're doing with that data. And so, so our, our starting point here is around how do we empower our customers to protect and to activate their data? Mm. Andrew. You've actually ended up talking about a few of my slides already, but that's fine. I know, it, that's, it's, uh, it, it's these questions. Yeah, no, I know. Um, I mean, so this is us in a nutshell. So we have five products, and you're not going to see all five today. You're going to see some. But we believe everyone should protect their data and then get value from it. They should activate that data. And by protect, we don't just mean backup. We mean security posture. We mean archiving it when it's retired or old or not of immediate value. Uh, and in Activate, we don't just mean trends. Obviously, a backup had, takes a snapshot every day. We don't just mean that. We don't just mean exporting it to other services, though that as well. We also mean using it in your development cycle, in your test cycle, anonymizing it so you have realistic, lifelike data to accelerate your, your deployment cycle as you, as you go. I'm going to have to step in the way each time, aren't I? I was going to talk about the shared responsibility model, but Graham touched on this earlier, and I think you're probably all familiar with it anyway. But we spend a lot of our time actually educating the market. And, and to your question about Salesforce, Salesforce do it as well. They have a backup product. They talk about the shared responsibility as a result of that. So they, they provide the platform. You are responsible for everything in there. I often use an analogy of like our personal social media. Facebook is not going to go down. Facebook's not going to delete my account unless I break the terms and conditions. But if I log into Facebook and delete all my photos, that's on me. Um, that's nothing to do with them. If I write my password down on a post-it note and leave it on a table, and somebody logs in and deletes all my photos, that's on me as well. And so that's what we mean about the shared responsibility model. And customers are more and more aware of that. And to the, the hockey stick that, you know, line that was mentioned yeah, earlier. Really There's a lot more, if, yeah. If just writing down a password, breaks your account, they ought to be providing um, dual factor. Password. Entirely, and that's all about security posture. to give yeah. you the tools that you need and not encourage you to do it that and, and they do, and that's perhaps not a good example. I should retire <laughs> that one. But, uh, but yeah, no, you're quite right. The, and when we talk about protect, we talk about security posture, which doesn't just mean how users authorise and authenticate. It means what can they do when they're actually in the system? What can they access? How have you secured? How are you uh, classifying your data? Have you even classified it? Because as you'll see, a uh, few, few stats for you. Um, the, the sources of these are at the bottom, but a third, close to a third, uh, Forrester says, um, of customers experience a one gig data loss on a monthly basis. Now, Salesforce measures records, by a no most records, by a nominal 2K per record. That's 500,000 records. That is not a sales rep accidentally deleted. Per month. Per month, yeah, so uh, 32%. Every month. every month. 32, nearly a third of customers experience a significant data loss on a monthly basis. And it, what, what, how do you, find, do you define loss in this uh, context? It could be anything from a record to a field getting overwritten through perhaps an integration or a user error or a migratory uh, mistake on that. But it's data that was on a record that has been either partially or entirely lost or corrupted. We, we say data loss, so we sometimes mean corrupted as well. You know, a, a field got overwritten in the... Uh, they can't be regulated companies with that sort of level of data loss, can they? Because you would hope not. Uh, yeah, yeah. This is the entire ecosystem. This isn't our customer base. This is, uh, is everyone. The other 78? 68. Mm. 68. I would ask them how, if they're not using recovery products, how do they know they've not had a data loss? Because they won't be getting alerts and they won't be actively monitoring either. This is 84% users have access to sensitive data, and that might mean that they're over-provisioned. It might mean that it is unclassified to the, to the corrective point there. Um, but yes, some of that 
is that users of systems aren't particularly well trained and sensitive data ends up in comments fields or description fields rather than classified dedicated fields, social security number, national insurance number, those, those types <coughs> of things. Um, and from the uh, data, uh, the data breaches, 75% involve the human element. I, I have a personal view on this. I think it's higher because an integration error or a migration error or whatever is still a human error ultimately at the end of the day. Somebody configured something incorrectly. But these are ones that involve a, a human element. The only ones that don't, someone mentioned ransomware, is mm. really malicious attacks. They're the only ones that don't involve a human error at somewhere. And even some of those, you could argue someone fell for a phishing link or exposed their credentials or left their phone somewhere. And if I may, I, I'm, I'm sorry. GDPR, right? I mean, the, the companies that have these problems are almost certainly in breach of GDPR. Well, with the data loss, you're required to notify the regulator, yeah, uh, in, under, in European law, yeah. I was talking to Salesforce some time ago. They didn't seem to think that it mattered because, as far as they're concerned, <laughs> Um, if it was kept in America in their databases, um, there was a safe harbor agreement that sort of protected them from any liability, which was totally wrong. Mm. But, um, so they may have been encouraging their customers to believe that mm. these sort of things didn't really matter. Uh, well, that depends. I, I guess that's the perspective view because Salesforce are not going to delete your data. So for them, they're like, well, it wasn't us, right? If you deleted your data um, or there was a data, whatever, data loss, data regress. But if you're keeping it in their databases, the market. They have some responsibilities there, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. They have data centers globally, um, like most UK customers are London and Paris or London and Munich. So. If I may, I just wanted to chip on the ransomware point because uh, you're based on our experience and studies, but it's also replicated in studies from other vendors uh, and, and technology firms, is the, the number one cause of SaaS data loss is typically human error. Uh, number two is integrations uh, that have gone awry, uh, fields have been mismatched and so forth. But number three, but obviously growing like a rocket, is ransomware. Uh, I think it was you that, that, that mentioned this. Now, we should be clear, we do not purport that we're going to protect your organization from a ransomware yeah. attack. We can help mitigate some of those risks through our security solution. But what we will say is that <coughs> anybody is susceptible to a ransomware attack. And what you need to make sure is that you have backups of your mission critical data such that if you are locked out of your solution, you still have access to that data because we keep it independently. Uh, or such that if, uh, if, if you're subject to ransomware, you can spin up a new instance and we have all of your data to boot back into it. So I, I think it's, uh, it's, it's an important clarification there. I think the concern was that if you drop a really smart ransomware could go in and just infect several generations. Mm. <coughs> so you guys could do the perfect backup. You mm. bang up something that will never recover. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, one, one thing we're seeing is uh, isn't, isn't the backup becoming a primary attack vector for ransomware attacks, right? That's where they're going first. Because that's yeah. Gonna yeah. yeah, we're aware of that. We, you know, I've got a slide coming out later on around our security credentials, and uh, uh, we, for our customers, the backups can be stored in AWS, uh, Azure. If they choose to bring their own storage, we can support that as well. So that there are uh, there are ways of supporting different different customers around those protection uh, checking, mechanics. Going to the backup solution, that's not something you cover. Sorry, again. Actually, checking the data is correct going to the backup solution. So own, own no. can do a perfect backup, but won't know if it's also backed up. Correct. I think so. That's correct. I yeah. think that's fair to say. Yeah, yeah. Well, Sorry, they Andrew. They should be doing check restore, shouldn't they? So part, part of testing your backups is you should be storing data, some of the data, all the time. So you should start noticing that um, it no longer restores. Then you can go back a couple of generations to the backup. I think what you'll see in, in the demo as well with those smart al alerts that we spoke about earlier, if data was corrupted within those backups, that's something that those alerts would pick up because that data is changed. Mm -hmm. So then users would be alerted that within the backup some data has been corrupted. Um, and then briefly on, on, on fines, you kind of spoke about this. There's a cost to downtime. Um, in terms of lost revenue, in terms of lost productivity. There is a cost to data breach, which could be regulatory fines. Again, it could be, uh, really the, the sources for these are all, all listed below. And significant fines for non-compliance events. You mentioned GDPR a couple of times, right? That's obviously very prevalent in the, uh, in the UK and, there's, uh, and Europe. And there's equally as valid uh, uh, regulations in the US uh, too. My, my, my concern about that sort of risk is that the 
it's long term. Mm. You don't go out of business immediately after you've had a data breach. Yeah. But customers start looking at the competition with it, and you go out of business two or three years down the line. Yeah. The time you've forgotten it was a data breach that caused people to lose confidence in your company. Yeah, and that reputational damage, as you say, is hard to, uh, it's a slow death, right? Um, Mark Benioff has stopped saying this, but used to, like five, six years ago, say that Salesforce, any cloud provider, is only one significant data breach from going out of business, right? Uh, and that's why they take such care over their data centers and, and to our security credentials, we, we do as well. How much of a driver is um, Dora your business? Increasingly important. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I mentioned earlier on that we have an appetite to work with regulated industries. Uh, you know, regulatory standards like that uh, support us in doing that. Yeah, we, we have uh, relevant certification for, for example, HIPAA for healthcare um, and, and, and multiple others, including industry specific. So, yeah, it matters and it's important to us. We have a number, you know, and, and evidence of that, we've got a number of, of marketing activities that are happening just now, talking exactly around DORA, webinars and such like. Yeah, yeah. There are You're up. <coughs> Sorry. Your, your customers will, especially the Fortune 500 customers, will have existing backup arrangements. Yes. Have you pursued any ideas of partnership with existing enterprise backup suppliers so that, for example, their dashboards could include your backup status? Yes, but nothing that's been brought to market. Mm. Is it active, actively under consideration? I, I, I don't know the answer to that question. Well, I, I do know that, uh, that, that colleagues in our partners and alliances teams engage with a wide number of different partners, including the group that you've just talked about. I, I, I just genuinely don't know the, yeah, the, the I mean, status of that. It's an interesting um, point, I think, given that we're in a, you know, a hybrid, it's a hybrid world, right? Mm. Customers have a range of applications on premises and on the cloud. Yeah. Uh, and in some respects, this reminds me of the security industry where the application, right? Well, I'm like, no, I need to secure this application. I'm going to buy something to secure this application. I need to buy a new product to back up this application. Um, and, and that, in, 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 um, in aggregate, adds to complex, ultimately complex to the customer. It does, yeah. yeah. So, yeah but the business level, isn't it? You, you, you're able to back up your data. You want to back up your customer acquisition system. If that spreads across a mainframe and a SaaS solution, mm. you want to cover the whole business area. Yeah, I, 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 we certainly see an appetite for, and there was a question earlier on, but we see an appetite for vendor consolidation. I'll give you an example, and this was another one of my recent new customer interviews. This was last week. Uh, and this was a customer that was already using uh, Commvault in different parts of their business, but wasn't using Commvault for SaaS data protection. Uh, and Commvault has an offering for Salesforce, it has an offering for Microsoft 365. These were the two SaaS applications of particular importance to the, the, this customer. Uh, the relationship with Commvault was owned by the IT team, uh, and the, but not by the separate Salesforce administrative team. Uh, and there was quite a debate within the organisation between the Salesforce administrative team and IT, with IT saying, hey, we've got, we, we really like Commvault, they're doing a great job in protecting our data centers and this, that, and the other. And they've got SaaS application solutions. And because of our buying power with them, we can get them really cheap. So we'd like to put everything in with, uh, in with Commvault. The Salesforce admin team had to say, yes, we understand all those benefits, but, but the architecture of Salesforce is such that it needs special dedicated resource. So it was a best of breed versus a consolidated, consolidated vendor all-in-one argument. Uh, we increasingly see that if Salesforce matters to the customer organization, then they will go the best of breed route. Uh, but it, cer it certainly happens. And, and if I may go back to, I don't think I quite fully rounded off my answer to your question, is that yeah, we are, we, we are certainly aware of the broader market and, and having lots of conversations with, uh, <coughs> with partners of all sorts. Um, your, 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 your colleague mentioned Kevin Delane earlier on, our new Chief Revenue Officer. One of Kevin's uh, um, uh, areas of, of historic success is around leveraging partner and channel. Uh, so we're doubling down in those areas just now. I can't tell you any more about, uh, about where we exactly we stand or, or future plans around you know, relationships with uh, some of those legacy or established backup and recovery well, providers. Them, but uh, uh, I can't tell you any more. It interests me because years and years ago, I worked for a bank. We mm. had um, 
to test a couple of its systems, and it managed to get all its databases back, I was a DBA at the time, um, that was no problem at all. Couldn't get the business back because the data center they were restoring the stuff into didn't have enough phone lines at the exchange wow. <laughs> came the business. So wow. tells me immediately you need to back up everything you need yeah. for mm -hmm. the business, not just the data. Yeah, absolutely. I don't think, I, we, we, wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't argue with that for one second. I think that, <laughs> yeah, w w there's, there's elements we can help with and there's aspects that, that we can. You train people, because a lot of that is, is about training. But people, you give it to the IT, but all they do is back up the databases. You need to have somebody who actually understands the discipline of business recovery. Yeah. And that needs, that, that's not sort of uh, a common skill. Yeah, and even understand SAS and the difference that has to, uh, to, to databases in, in that example. Yeah, and, and we often see with, mul with many of our products that, you know, if we talk about secure, for instance, the CISO doesn't speak Salesforce. They don't speak ServiceNow. They speak InfoSec. And the gap there between the SaaS platform and the, uh, the CISO's kind of expectations and requirements is often not aligned. It's terminology gap, it's a language gap. Um, so we, we often see that. And the same is true from on-prem to, to SaaS as well. Yeah. So do you have trading facilities or do you have trading partnerships? But, um... We, I mean, my team, so the technical account managers report to me, they only look after a very small number of our customers. They provide training to the customers, and that is generally enterprise and strategic customers who recognize the severity and the need for the, for the training. One thing we do at, um, we can call it the you know, commercial space, is uh, data recovery readiness uh, assessment. We call it a DR3. It's, it's like, what do you actually do when you have a data loss? Who do you let know? Um, who's the incident commander? It's all these kind of really simple things. Is there an email distribution list? All of this really simple stuff around handling the data loss right through to actually using the tools as well. Yeah. Whoever you need to tell, you have to tell. Yeah, and that could be, it could be shareholders, it could be regulator, it could be, it could be the media, yeah. Tell you got the stuff back. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm mindful of time. We're approaching quarter past the hour, which means we've got about 30 minutes left in which to uh, cover a bit yeah. more ground. We really want to show you some, some solutions and action. Yeah, so, so we're going to split the demo into two. So we're going to talk about Protect, and the, as soon as I hand to Alex, the closer to demo uh, you, you actually are. Um, but yeah, there's the three main points on Protect, and we'll talk about Activate uh, uh, a bit later. Yeah, perfect. So before we jump into a demonstration, just a quick overview of the product suite that we have our own. So we have our Recover solution, which um, thank you for all the questions. We're going to make sure that we cover them in, in the demonstration. But this is all about being able to identify where there's been a data loss, a data corruption, and restore in an effective and timely manner. Our secure solution is all about understanding the security posture of Salesforce environments. With Salesforce, more and more data is being added onto the tools as customers, they're deconsolidating the tech stack, adding more onto Salesforce with more users, and this comes with more risk. So being able to understand exactly where the risks are within Salesforce and the uh, remediation actions that they need to take, that's what our secure tool helps with. Accelerate, this is all about populating production-like data into those sandboxes. So when we talk about testing recovery, what the process looks like for that, this is where Accelerate will help those, those users. So with Accelerate, using that production-like data, mimicking a data loss and data corruption incident, and then mimicking then who's going to find out about that incident and who's going to go about restoring that, that data works within Accelerate. Of course, we also anonymize data within sandboxes too, because we often have developers working in sandboxes and you don't want them to see uh, PII data within those environments. Our archive solution is all about archiving data out of Salesforce. So with more data within Salesforce, the more we see system performance decrease, but also we have lots of legacy data in Salesforce that we no longer need. So archive, we, it's unlimited data storage and users can set up uh, policies in place to automatically offset data out of Salesforce and into the archive solution. 
and Discover is our newest product that we're going to dive into um, towards the end of today's session, which is all about <coughs> using historical backups, so time series data, to um, enable uh, tools uh, that use AI and machine learning to really predict trends and analysis on the historical data within the backups. But without further ado, what we're going to do is dive into, thank you, into uh, a demonstration of our, of our product. So focusing first on our backup and recovery solution. As already mentioned, it's an independent web application to Salesforce. It's completely um, external to the CRM solution, which is always industry best practice to have that separate uh, solution. So what this means when it comes to protecting our data and providing business uh, continuity is that when Salesforce goes down, which has happened over the number of years, there's one case in the last few months where users couldn't log in for four hours at a time. With this independent backup, users are able to jump in and access their data to continue their business activities. With the backups, we're backing up everything that falls onto Salesforce. So all the data as well as all of the metadata as well. So capturing everything and each of these different boxes that we can see on the screen, these are the different Salesforce environments that are connected to own and backing up the environment automatically on a daily basis. Now we already discussed, okay, we've got a backup, but actually what about recovering? So if we take a look at our, one of our environments, so our global production environment, so what we can see within this environment is we can see the status of our latest backups, but we can also use own to monitor our data. <coughs> so within, within Salesforce, it's quite difficult to understand if anything out of the normal is happening. So within the platform, we can filter on any business critical object that we have at any time frame within the backup. So for example, if we want to have a look at November all the way till now, February the 22nd, what users can see is nice and visually where data has been added, changed and removed. And should anything out the normal they see within this particular graph, for example, here we can see there's been a spike in data loss. Uh, so what, what that's saying is that on the 13th of January, there were 27 accounts deleted. Users can click into that data point and they can see that backup to understand which accounts were deleted, but also the magnitude of that data loss. So with Salesforce, as already mentioned, you the relationships um, are pretty significant. You have grandfather objects with um, many different grandchildren, as well as lookup relationships to those records. So in, in Salesforce term, deleting an account record, this causes a cascade delete and actually can cause what we see here, opportunity to be deleted, complaints, tasks, and so on and so forth. So when it comes to restoring, we need to understand exactly what's also <coughs> been deleted within the environment. And all of the backups that we have are always full copy backups. So this is how we're able to exactly understand the scope of that data loss and data corruption. Whereas we see with other organizations with their backups, they're only doing incremental backups. So with those incremental backups, it's really hard to understand the actual scope of what's been deleted. You mentioned for copy, but where? Uh, in the same place, uh, you mentioned AWS, uh, mm -hmm. Azure, uh, yeah. you can do multiple copying different uh, yeah so so with they, they've got at least four different redundancy zones whether you go with aws or azure in addition for some of our customers who like to follow the rule of three when it goes to backups you can also export the backups as well to their own aws um snowflake <coughs> s3 bucket um, and so on and so forth for that additional rule of three backups too this application is a SaaS application SaaS application for each customer, no, uh, just multi-tenant application. Yeah. 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 So we handle all of the security controls for them. It's all unlimited data storage as well for them. If you do only full backups, it mm -hmm. needs a lot of storage. How does this influence the storage cost of the customers if they are, let's say, available? The, there is no implication. Our pricing model it gives customers unlimited storage and data retention. So the, the storage price is your business. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And this is a really important point as well because 
This is exactly how we're scalable with customers as well, because especially with Salesforce, we're seeing a significant growth across all of our customers in terms of the data that they're putting onto the system. So being able to scale in terms of not charge for any data storage with the, with the customers is something that they really value at own. If you had, <coughs> say, a thousand seat install, mm -hmm. typical size data, from the time you kick it, say it's set to happen at three in the morning, <coughs> approximately how long before you've got this full backup? Like, how long does it take? And how do you decide? Like, because obviously some companies will be running 24-7. Uh -huh. If you run a full one and it takes half an hour, an hour, two hours, does that mean that it, it starts there? How do you freeze it if you're also including metadata? How do, you, how, do you, how do you guarantee you've got the backup if it's a moving target? So we, we guarantee if you've, got less, if you've got fewer than a billion records, we will back it up in less than a day. And we're high. Less than a day? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Now, for, for a thousand users, it's probably significantly quicker. It, the, the true answer is going to be it depends, of course. Um, not many have more than a billion records in their, in their instances. Um, you, you have a point of time, though, because if it's taking a day to back up, yeah. um, the data may not be consistent. But That's what I'm thinking, yeah. Yes. So, so there aren't many, the, I, I couldn't, I could not, I mean we've got 6,700 customers, I could not tell you the average backup time, I, I really could not. We've got some that take 15 minutes and we've got some that take a day. Yeah. You have to have a point of time. Yeah, so. no, exactly that. And, and all of these cloud providers, as you would expect, are auditing records when they're changed. We know when our last backup was and we just check for, for what records have changed in that time, since the last backup. Uh, exactly. since you're, sorry, um, since you're targeting regulated industries, is it a challenge for some that their data is then stored on an Amazon or on Geo Cloud? Well, uh, um, I'm not sure I understand the question, uh, but, but, but what I could say... Regulations that, live, that limit the extent to which they can use public clouds for storing their backup. Not that I'm aware of, but that's why we have, we have the options of they can go AWS, they can go Azure, or they can bring their own storage. <coughs> So yeah. if, uh, if they want to go private cloud, then, then, then we've got capacity to support that as well. And just, just to add to that as so well, as part of uh, the, a the AWS or the Azure solution, customers can also bring their own encryption key. Mm. So when we are selling into uh, industries where it's you know, got certain regulations, that's when they'll bring their own encryption key to protect that data. I mean, especially in, in the continental Europe, mm -hmm. you're not allowed to bring the data out of continental Europe. Yeah. And also, there's very much suspicion about having data, um, sensitive data on AWS or Azure, even if it's encrypted or whatever. So uh, if they pre uh, if we prefer to take one of those smaller cloud providers, which are German-based or something, or European-based at least, would you support that? Not on-prem, but they decide to go to Bechtel or they decide to go to, um, there's one French company who stores data a lot and so on. Would you support that? So currently we're just supporting AWS and Azure. Um, but most of our, so for those continental customers, majority of them do go with our AWS yeah. uh, data center base in Frankfurt. Mm -hmm because obviously they've got so many rules and regulations and that actually feeds the majority of security concerns that they have and then on top of that they add their own encryption key. Okay. You have key management facilities because if you're giving people their own encryption key mm -hmm. and they lose their encryption key, that's equivalent to losing their data unless you've got some kind of um, dual access which means two people can recreate the key or something like that because you really don't want to have it's not us, it's the... Yeah, no, agreed. It's, so we don't provide the key management, it's through AWS um, yeah. who, who provide that. And, and you're right, If by the way, if they bring it, we don't have access to their data and we don't have a copy of their key. And if they delete their key, corrupt their key, they've lost their backups. Yeah, that is, so that is true. So the straight answer is yes, we, have, we offer advanced key management, but yeah. le leveraging the, yes. the options there. Because encryption is very seductive. It's a, a big risk by itself. If you Correct, know. yes. Mm -hmm. Or if you change the key and leaves the, leaves the company, that's a good way of yeah. losing data. <laughs> yeah, for, for sure. Um, and also when it comes to uh, talking about losing data <coughs> and that recovery piece, so we did touch upon smart alerts earlier. So just to show you what, what exactly that looks like. So we have 
three different types of alerts that our customers set um, within their backups. So we have the statistical outlier, and this is typically an alert that you can set any object, and it looks at a 60-day window period, and it understands typical trends or behavior for that particular object. So for example, let's say we set it on the contact object, what OWN will do here is to understand how many contacts are typically added, changed, removed each day. Should anything out of the normal happen, then an alert will be triggered from the backup and send uh, the users an email notification to say, hey, something out of the normal has happened, more contacts have been changed than normal, here's a list of contacts that have been changed. We also have our more specific alerts as well. We have our more than or less than that we can set on any amount of records or percentage of records where they've been <coughs> removed, changed or added. So any particular business critical objects that our businesses have, this is where they set the alerts on. Also, if they have any rules internally where users aren't able to delete accounts or delete emails or things like that, they can set these alerts on, on those objects. So should an incident happen, then the users will receive an email notification to say, hey, someone managed to delete your email, someone managed to delete your accounts, and you can know straight away and go and identify which records and which user that was. Did you set up some kind of um, alert, that would, something like based on processing, whatever detect that large, scale, large amounts of records were in the process of being encrypted? Being encrypted from the Salesforce side? or yeah. Somebody stuck something in there and it's encrypting your files, and then we'll see the sooner you find that. Not while it's in, not while it's happening on Salesforce, because we're a point in time, and we would see the records have changed because there'd be uh, some kind of marker on the records that they've changed, but we wouldn't see it happening. I guess yeah. it'd be a fairly obvious characteristic that if somebody's encrypting lots of records, the processing would be different. That's what I was wondering if you could detect yeah. it. Uh, the other thing I wondered about was policy-based alerts because without knowing exactly what sort of alerts you're getting, the business might want to say, we expect to see 3% of our accounts disappear every month, mm -hmm. and express it in those sort of business terms, mm -hmm. so the business managers can check the alerts make sense, rather than just having a, a technical level. Does that make sense? Yeah, so you, you, can, yeah, you can do that percentage, so if you expect those 3% of accounts to change, then you can set those alerts for more than 3%. And you can specify in business terms, so a business user would understand what's going on. Because quite often on down databases and this sort of tool, um, the power's there, but the business user can't relate to yeah. what the technician is actually setting in the database. Mm. Mm -hmm. So can we can we set smart alert thresholds based on number of records, but also can we could it be stated as percentage? It can percentage be changes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It can. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And to show you all what a smart alert would uh, looks like, so I did have some data that was deleted on my Salesforce org not so long ago, and I did receive a smart alert um, on the alerts that I had set up. So you can see it came directly from OWN, and we can see the three different alerts that were triggered. So it let me know that 121 opportunity records were deleted, 90 accounts, and 101 contacts were, record, uh, were deleted. One thing to note here as well is a lot of the prospects that I've spoken to that have experienced data loss and data corruption, they don't typically have a tool that alerts them when data has been deleted and corrupted. And I've seen where uh, prospects have taken um, weeks, if not months, to know that some data was corrupted in the environment and they don't have a backup and the users don't remember what the information was for those particular records. So having a tool to ultimately identify the data that's been deleted significantly reduces the recovery time objectives when it comes to restoring the data. Now, from this particular process, we've got this email. We want to understand what's been deleted. We can go straight to the backup from the email, uh, sort of going right into the own platform. And it takes us exactly to that full backup to understand the large scope of data loss and potential data corruption here as well. And with the backups, we can also relabel them as well. So we can refer back to them in the future too. And here we can see that each backup is always comparing itself directly to the previous backup and we can see all the data that's been deleted, all the data that's been changed and all the data that's been added. 
Now, when it comes to recovery, we always want to start at the highest level, so at that parent level, to identify which top level um, records we want to restore before then identifying the related children for those records. Uh, so all we need to do here is we understand accounts at always the highest level, so we can kick off what we call a quick compare job. So for those business users to actually understand, okay, which records are we dealing with that's been deleted and which ones have been corrupted and which ones do we need to restore. So once that job has loaded, what it allows us to do is dive into that object. We can see the tech live backup I've just relabeled, uh, comparing itself directly to the previous backup. And we can see in nice and color code those 90 records that have been deleted. We can see all the rows of those accounts and all the fields for each of those different account names. And what we can see straight away <coughs> is that there's been a mixture of prospect and customer accounts that have been deleted. And here we've actually made the decision that we only want to restore the customer accounts back into Salesforce, not the prospect accounts. So this is where we can start to precisely restore which records, uh, where we can filter to on any standard or custom fields uh, within these records. So here we want the type of accounts to be customer. And what we'll see, those 90 accounts will then turn to 45 accounts to be restored. And then we can simply add them to our restore bucket, which is our pre-restore process, mm -hmm. before we then gather all the related mm -hmm. children as part of that restoration. But before we do that, we also want to look at those 58 records that have changed in between the two backups as well. We want to make sure there's been no corruption. So I'm simply going to only show the changed fields, which we can see highlighted in yellow. And we can hover over each of the different fields to investigate to see what the previous value was of those fields and what the new value is. And here we can see in that phone field that there has been some clear corruption that's gone on where the value was once a phone number, it is now XXX. Um, so what we want to do is we just want to precisely, out of those 58 records, just choose those phone fields to update. We actually, the billing state, the type, they've changed. We want that data to have changed. It's just the phone field we want to precisely restore. So here, all we need to do is just identify only those records where the phone field has changed. So we'll see that 58 will then change to 15 records, and then we can add these records to our restore bucket. Alice, can I jump in? Oh, sorry, please. You can restore any, each and any field of each and any record right yes. on there. Right. Yes, yeah. exactly. And the, the benefit of being able to precisely restore singular fields is that with other solutions, you'll see that they'll write over all of the records, so they'll lose a lot of the good data that they had. Whereas here, we're just restoring just the data uh, that was corrupted. Yeah. We're behind schedule. <laughs> I think it's because of, of all the questions, and, the, and, and we welcome those questions. But uh, Alice, what I'd like to suggest we, we do is there was an appetite uh, around GDPR and managing those requests, so let, let's quickly talk to that. Uh, and then we're going to switch to uh, how we help our customers to activate their data. We have a new solution coming to market to discover. So, mm -hmm. so uh, we'll, we'll finish off on the backup and recovery piece and protecting gate data to now in talking about GDPR, and, and then we'll switch yeah. to discover if yeah. that's yeah. okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Alice. Perfect. So just to round off how we can restore the data back into Salesforce in that timely matter, we have our two buckets, the data that's been deleted, the data that's been corrupted. All we need to do is uh, hit preview restore, which will create two different jobs. One job where it will show us those 15 different records with those phone fields to revert back to the original values. And we can do that by hitting that green button and the second job where it shows us those 45 deleted accounts. And what it's done now is it's pulled in all the related children for those customer accounts that were deleted as part of that data loss scenario. Now, if we didn't want to restore the children, we could simply unselect those, rac those records, or we can be uh, specific again and open them up and precisely choose which records we want to restore. And once satisfied, we can hit start restore and own will start pushing the data back into Salesforce. So you need very strong security around this because you could um, have to be linked up to the security as a whole because not only could you make a mistake and come up with better ways of making incompatible changes, yep. 
could be if you wanted to um, put your own name in a certain account field or something like that, this would be a good time to do it while you're fixing a genuine problem. Just go in there and sort of make a few <laughs> unauthorised changes. Yep. So it either needs to link in with the security of the organisation as a whole. Agreed. For, yeah. for sure. And, and that's why we provide an audit log within our, in our backup solution, which is essentially a view for, it's read-only for users to see every user that's logged into the platform, um, any changes, anything they've downloaded, any activity of restoration being one of them that they've conducted, they have this activities log, and one data is being restored, an email sent out to all the users on that platform as well for visibility. We, we use Okta as an identity provider. We don't provide our own security. We've gone best of breed there as well. Now, when it comes to GDPR requests, uh, Within, within the backups, so users forgetting individuals within uh, the Salesforce environment. There's three different ways that they can then mask the data within the backups. So the first way is they can automate this in Salesforce, so they can essentially have a button that they can trigger into OWN to then mask all of that data within the backups. But the other two ways is directly within the OWN platform themselves, where users can come in and they can individually forget a record, so they can just upload the ID of the records they want to mask, or they can run a bulk forget where they can upload a CSV of all of those IDs for those records they want to mask. More so, if any uh, individual has changed their last name, maybe they got married, uh, we can also rectify records as well within the backup so that we can change the last name there. So this means when we go to restore the data, they're going to be restored uh, with the correct uh, last name in that scenario. So now when it comes to activating the data uh, within from, from the backups. Um, so what we've also realized is that backups, they do contain uh, valuable business insights with time series data. So if we think about Salesforce, it is just uh, the data as it is within the platform, whereas with the backups, it's all the different versions of the different field changes within the backups. And backups have typically laid dormant, they've been difficult to access, and what we've seen is the backups have lied in a format that just isn't analytics or AI ready. It's a good uh, impact on performance too. If you can do your analysis against a backup, mm -hmm. you're not impacting the, the real time. It, exactly, no API Correct. calls from the Salesforce side. It's, um, yeah, exactly, good point. And with backup data, what we believe is that it can be transformative and, and turn businesses' backups into their own strategic assets. So having access to the, the backup allows businesses to essentially identify trends and uncover hidden risks, opportunities within the business that they may not have noticed otherwise with just <coughs> Salesforce being as it is today and not that time series data format. And with AI and machine learning, what we're essentially doing is enabling these models to learn from businesses' backups, to ultimately then to create decisions and actions that customers can take as a result from their time series uh, backups, and also share these, this data with other systems for analysis and operational needs. So from this, what we're doing is we're excited to announce that we have a brand new product called Own Discover. It's a secure, scalable, data service that enables fast, easy, and seamless access to SaaS data backup in an analytics and uh, time series format. But before we run into a demo of the product, there's a few features to call out. So Discover, it, um, it comes with its own API where customers can now actually access their backup data from any system that they have um, with, uh, with any time series dimension. And what we're doing is we're providing our own fully managed data lake house, eliminating any extract, transform, and load tool needed for our customers. And to give you an idea of what it looks like for customers as it is today to do this analysis, um, what customers would have is they would have to have their own ETL tool, their own uh, data warehouse, data lake, data um, engineers and developers to get their data into a format ready for analysis where they can add in their own AI and machine learning tool. 
But with Discover, it essentially it redefines what it means to own your data by providing a self-service access to analytics-ready data in a time series format. Discover is all about unlocking the business potential of historical uh, SaaS data by delivering it to the right data pipelines for any time series analysis to train AI and machine learning modules or to integrate to any destination system. Did you program that yourself, or is there some OEM program? <coughs> so, we, so we are taking care of the middle bit, and the customer is taking care of the bit on the right-hand side, so bring in the tools like a quick site, Tableau, Looker, with their own AI um, or machine learning modules. Did you, did you find out that customers would prefer to do AI processing of this data inside the own back of the environment? rather than having it pumped into an existing data warehouse with existing AI processing arrangements. It's a com you're adding complexity in one sense here, aren't you? I don't think we're adding complexity in, in one sense because a lot of our customers already were exporting our backups yeah. to their own data, data warehouse and plug in their own tools. But of course, with their own data warehouse, they were responsible for the cost of all the storage within that warehouse as well as the security of that data as well. So we are taking that away from them, but also they don't need to have a tool to get that data they don't, into they don't analytics. Stop using their existing data warehouse. So now they've got two. No, they don't. They have two. They have with their own. They just all they need to do is not have the data warehouse, but yeah. just get their own uh, analytics tool like a Tableau, a Looker, and just plug in directly to the backups. They There's can other systems take that, that away. They, they'd be going into another warehouse. Yeah. It, yeah, that will be the case for some customers, that they'll have existing data warehouse and tooling. And for that, th this is probably not a good candidate in that we will probably export to this. Um, so we're giving options here for customers. You can, you can export it. Sorry? You can export it. Yeah, Alice showed briefly earlier, you know, in, when she talked about the rule of three, you can export backups. So you can send them to a, data, uh, to a BI, oh, well, a warehouse, or even another S3 bucket, whatever you want to do with them, yeah. Did you mention also SQL or open data ex uh, portability? You, you, cannot, you can just uh, connect uh, yes. Yes. Yeah, and we're using SQL and OData. Yeah. Yeah. In this case, uh, you save the data link, uh, the data link uh, host, uh, and you just use the data browser. Again, it's going to vary, I guess, customer to customer. Yeah. Uh, Another question is, are you considering to use uh, for yourself to make analysis of the data, for example, for security, for uh, uh, <coughs> security analysis, uh, behavior of uh, data changes uh, or so on to, to provide uh, something more for a smart dollar compared to the number of changes or yeah, you, you, can, you can get that insight with Discover. Um, any changes in your data is what you can pull from Discover. And then you can connect your own AI or machine learning tool to really forecast then what you'd expect to see changes. Could we do it? Are considering yeah. to use this to provide a, a better service uh, to your customer oh, to, to our customers. understand uh, security uh, challenge or not that I'm aware of. No, I mean, we, we're always innovating our products, right? Um, I, I don't know. I can't speak to the product roadmap, so I, I don't know. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, you see amount of data you're shoving out of place, aren't you? If, if, you, if you've got the backups anyway, yeah. if you can get rid of the data warehouse and just process the backups, it seems to me to be a neater solution. It also increases the quality of your backup solution because if you're using the data yeah. continuously, people are taking it seriously. It's not just a, a bucket they shove somewhere. Yes. They've got it and come use them when they need it. And, and I, I think to the gentleman behind you's point, there's no one size fits all for enterprise, right? Some enterprises are going to have parts of this in place and, and others are not. Uh, this is about democratizing it to all of our customers, uh, regardless of size and, and capability and existing BI tooling that they, or data warehousing tooling that they have in place. Sorry, Alice. So th this is just a quick example, because um, I'm just cautious of time as, as well. But essentially, um, this is one of my dashboards from QuickSight, so using um, AWS SageMaker <coughs> as well to do some prediction analysis. But essentially, what I've done here is I've pulled on all my, my sales cloud data from my backups over the last five years. 
And what I can see from these different dashboard components is I can see data such as my actual. So here, we're looking at the pipeline trend by quarters within my backups. And I can see all the actuals over the last five years. But I can see the stage maker has made some prediction analysis that we can expect that pipeline to, to grow over the next three different years. Can you integrate data from Microsoft, Salesforce, and ServiceNow backups? into one analysis? Not yet. Not yet? Yeah. Okay, so only... At present, this, this is it. actually not even that, just for clarity. At present, the, this initial launch is exclusively on Salesforce. Mm -hmm. um, and in due course, yes, we will extend to those other platforms. But when do you see these extensions? I, we, I can't give you a definite date in terms of our product roadmap yet, I'm afraid. You can't get this information from Salesforce itself? We can't, or customers can't? Customers can't. Why should they use this if they can get it from Salesforce? So they can't get it from Salesforce. So the, the, the point with, with this is, so Salesforce is showing data as it is right now, yeah. but within the backups, if you so think they about... can't get this data yeah. from Salesforce. It's the time no. series, is the, it's it's the, the historic data is where the value is. Yeah. There is time series reporting in Salesforce, but it's limited <laughs> to uh, the scope of Salesforce reporting, which is fundamentally quite limited as well. Um, you definitely can't look at the whole backup holistically mm -hmm. across this sort of time frame um, as you can with native time series in, in Salesforce reports. And also another thing to call out as well is any data that's been offset the platform, whether it's been deleted or archived, it can also appear within the supporting as well. So you're reporting on data, legacy data that's no longer within the platform. Uh, good point, yeah. Um, so just to just show exactly how um, we can particularly use these insights to, to help drive a decision. So what you can see very blurrily here is that uh, we have an eight-year pipeline trend analysis by segment. We can see two different segments. Um, and where we can see the residential segment um, is, is pulling in more pipeline than any other segment and we can see that we're predicting to have a large spike in pipeline within that residential market. And when we look at a customer support side of things as well, so I've created another dashboard pulling in only my service cloud data. Um, I've made a dashboard where I can see the CSAT score for the two different markets, that residential and commercial. And I can see over a two year period that the CSAT score has been dropping in that residential section. And investigating further in the following component, I can see all my average hours to resolve um, a case by segment. And again, I can see that residential that residential segment has been increasing in time to respond to a case as well. So this particular example, they can make a decision now. They know there's going to be growth in the residential market. They can see that the CSAT score has been dropping. So then now they can make insight to double that support team supporting that residential market uh, to, to navigate the, the growing dr uh, demands uh, for residential. Coming up with the hook. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 yeah that, that was the sign that we're at time. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to talk over you. I'm, if, if, if I may, just, just, just one final word. We, we, we said at the start that our, our mission is around empowering customers to protect and activate their data. So with the protect piece, you saw backup and recovery. We didn't have time to demo some of those other products around secure and so forth, but I hope you understand and get a, a sense of our focus around that. Discover is very much about activating, getting value from that data and, and, and in a way that, uh, that it is really quite innovative in terms of the, the, the market in which we operate. Thank you so much for your time yeah. this morning. Thank you for all of your questions. We will, of course, be very happy to engage with any or all of you in, uh, in, in the days ahead. If you want us to, to meet again for further briefings or discussions uh, or interviews, then, then again, we'd be glad to do that. But, but thank you again for this morning. <laughs>